we have a star. This is this image looks familiar. I've seen it everywhere. It, it's been doing the rounds quite a lot. It's been on the news. So yes, this is an, an image with the James Webb Space Telescope pointing at a star, making a star of a star. So this is a calibration image. They really are at the point really of just making sure that the telescope's all focused and that everything's lined up and that they can actually get everything to work. I have struggled hard to think of anything interesting to say about this star. I've been looking in the literature to see what there is. It's a remarkably nondescript star. I suspect it was chosen probably because it's fairly boring, right? It's not, you know, it's not so bright that it would uh, sort of blind the telescope. It's not so faint that they wouldn't actually be able to use it to focus the telescope with. It's got no companions, so you can get a nice sharp image of an individual star. Has it got a cool name? No, it's got a telephone number. It's two mass, J, and then a whole bunch of numbers, I'm afraid. So it's a sufficiently nondescript star. It doesn't have any kind of name. It's too faint to have a, you know, a historic name. Uh, it's much fainter than anything you can see with the naked eye. Um, so it's, yes, not a very exciting star, I'm afraid. It's about 2,000 light years away, traveling towards us at a modest speed of 50 kilometers per second. So, you know, 2,000 light years away, it's kind of a modest distance. It's not very far, it's not very near. It's traveling towards us at about 50 kilometers per second, which is, you know, not very slow, not very fast. Uh, it's a bit brighter than the sun intrinsically. Um, so it's probably not, I don't think it's a main sequence star. I think it's probably off towards the giant branch. So it's a sort of slightly more giant star than the sun is. Uh, it's a, I think it's about 5,000 degrees, something like that in terms of its temperature. So a little bit cooler than the sun, which means it'll be a little bit redder than the sun. It, it really is a remarkably nondescript star. It's had its moment of glory now and now it'll fade back into obscurity. I did notice it now has its own Wikipedia page. Um, but the only thing the Wikipedia page says is, is that it was used for calibrating the James Webb Space Telescope. So I think that's probably the, you know, the highest point it's going to reach in terms of its stardom as a star. In some sense, this is the culmination, right? This is, this is a success, but it's been quite a lengthy process. If you remember the James Webb Space Telescope launched back um, several months ago now, made its way out to its orbit. Everything worked extremely well. Everything's gone incredibly well in terms of, for example, the launch was so good that they actually didn't have to do much by way of kind of mid-course correction as it was going to its orbit, which means they now have more fuel left over than they thought they'd have, which has effectively doubled the lifetime they think it's going to have. Um, so it's now should be out there taking doing ast astronomy for about the next 20 years. So all good news. But obviously then having got it there, the next thing they needed to do was set up the telescope. Just as you predicted, yep. it's all gone to plan. Absolutely. I was absolutely confident it was all going to go fine. And yeah, nothing could possibly go wrong. Um, I mean, you know, they're not at the end of the process. I think probably the things that are most likely to go wrong have now been passed. But that's not to say that there aren't still things where things could go astray. But it is, it's, today it's all been incredibly good news. And as I say, hopefully they've kind of passed the most difficult stages now. OK, calibration. So the first thing you do is you pick a star and you just take a picture with your telescope. And what you find the foot when you first take your picture is something that looks more or less like this. And of course here the problem is, so actually there is only one star in this image, although it looks like there are many stars. That's because there are 18 separate mirrors. And of course they're all pointed in slightly different directions, which means that the, the, where the image appears is slightly different for each of the 18 uh, mirrors that they've got there. And so you end up first of all with this you know, complete mess of the stars all over the place. And of course the first thing you have to do is you don't actually even know which mirror corresponds to which image here. So the first thing you do is you wiggle each mirror a little bit in turn and see which image moves. And so once you've done that, you can then kind of identify which of those images corresponds to which mirror. So that kind of gives you your first sort of calibration point of telling you, you know, what's going on, what's producing what. Professor, what does the word wing mean on that? So I think that's, the, these are the ones, remember that the, the telescope kind of unfolded and I think wings are the ones, the, the mirrors on the edges are the bits that kind of folded out. And I think so there's, yeah, because there's, there's three on each side. And so I suspect that they, these are the two, two wings worth of mirrors that have folded out. So once you've figured out what's what, then the next sort of sensible thing to do is you rearrange them. And so this is just basically, again, moving the mirrors around. So they've got little pistons behind them so they can redirect the mirrors. They can move them in and out to focus, but they can also move them around to, to change their orientation relative to one another. So you would just rearrange them in a much more rational pattern so that you know which mirror is which and what's where without having to keep referring to some kind of random pattern of things. So that's the, the alignment that they did of just kind of getting the, all the mirrors in individual, individually in the right places. And you can just see looking at them, you know, some of them are relatively close to being in focus and some of them look completely horrible at this point. Um, and so the next thing you need to do then is, is focus each of these individually. And there are lots of tricks that they could play to do the focusing. 
Um, for example, so there's the secondary mirror, which is the bit that, so the light comes to the primary mirror, out to the secondary mirror, back to the, the instruments at the back. You can move the secondary mirror, which sort of changes the focus of the whole telescope. And by changing the focus of the telescope in that kind of controlled way and seeing how those images change, you can figure out how far out of focus the individual mirrors are, what direction you need to move them in to bring them into focus. So the next stage of the process was each of those 18 mirrors needed to be brought into focus, which is this step here, where everything is now much sharper than it was before, everything is nicely in focus. Of course, at this point, you've still got all your mirrors pointed in slightly different directions, which is why you have this sort of array of images rather than one image. So the next thing you want to do is point all the mirrors in exactly the same direction, which will bring all those image images together, which is what we get to with this point here. It, which looks kind of like the final point that we were trying to get to, but it isn't quite. And the reason what still hasn't been done is all that's happened here is, so each of those little segments is acting like a little, you know, one and a bit meter telescope, rather than a single six and a half meter telescope. And when you bring them all together, you just end up, you end up with a, the same amount of light that you get from your full six and a half meter telescope. But the quality of the images is just the quality of the image that you get from a, a one meter telescope rather than a six meter telescope. And so the sharpness of the images is being driven by those individual mirrors. You've just added the light together. So you just combined everything together to produce a single, you know, a, a brighter image because it's got all the light there. But the sharpness of the image is still being limited by the fact that it's only the single mirrors that you're seeing that are producing the images. So the final stage of the process is a thing called phasing the mirror, which is that you need to make it, instead of a whole bunch of effectively separate telescopes all pointing in more or less the same direction, you need it to be behaving as if it were a single mirror, six and a half meters across, which means you need to align all of those mirrors perfectly to within a fraction of a wavelength of light. And, so, and, and once you've done that, then the light from one side of the mirror and the light from the other side combines in this coherent fashion, which means that the whole thing acts as if it were a single mirror. And, and again, there are, the, there are sort of tricks, calibration tricks that are built into the telescope. So for example, within the instrument that you, that's being used to do the focus, there is a way to effectively put the telescope out of focus, but in a very controlled way. So before, when we were doing that course thing, as I say, you just basically move the secondary mirror in and out. But within the instrument itself, there are actually a, a kind of optical components that allow you to put the telescope out of focus in a very controlled way. And you can use how the images change when you change the focus in that very controlled way to figure out exactly how much you need to move the individual components around to get them all to behave like this single mirror. But I'm, and obviously these pistons aren't like, you know, the holes in my belt where you've got four or five options. You can really fine grain it. It really is very, very finely adjusted because you are literally moving the things by less than, you know, less than a single, much less than a single wavelength of light. So that brings us back to this, which is when that final stage of the process has been done. The mirrors have all been phased in this way so that actually you know, the, the sharpness of the image here is the sharpness you get from a six and a half meter telescope, not from a 1.3 meter telescope. And indeed they've measured the sharpness of the image and it's spot on. As, in fact, it's, I think it's slightly exceeded the expectations as to how well they thought they'd be able to do this whole process. Professor, anyone that looks at that image, one of the first things they're going to comment on are those huge spikes coming off. We've, talk, we've done a video many years ago about diffraction spikes, but can you explain why there are those spikes coming off the star? That's not part of the star, is it? No, the star really is point-like, at least at the, the image quality that we can get um, with, a, with a, a telescope like JWST. So all the bits you see sticking out here are artifacts associated with the telescope. The, the big ones you see, that sort of six-pointed star, is to do with the hexagonal symmetry of the telescope. And effectively, it's effectively a, a hexagonal mirror rather than a round mirror. And so the, the sharp spikes you see sticking out are artifacts associated with those straight edges, that six-fold symmetry of a hexagon. So that's those ones. And then the other bit that you can see sticking out the middle here, that's an additional diffraction feature. And that's associated with the fact that there's, there's this secondary mirror, which is held up by a tripod of legs. And so those, there's a sort of shadow from those three legs that are also cast on the mirror, which have their own diffraction effects. And this is an artifact that arises from that diffraction. Why is this not a problem? Are we not going to get these god awful spikes on all our lovely images of the early part of the universe? We absolutely are. And in fact, so you know, as you can see, there's not only this star here, but there's many other objects in this field. And actually, each of those has these features as well. Um, but you can't see them. And the reason you can't see them is, or perhaps conversely, the only reason why you see them on this star here is this is a really bright star it's from JWST's point of view. You know, they're rare, very rarely going to observe anything as bright as this. So these spikes are a tiny fraction of the total light in the middle. The light in the middle here is completely saturated. 
And so in terms of you know, how big an effect it is relative to the star itself, it's a tiny thing. And so when you start looking at fainter objects, you know, there are even fainter spikes sticking out from them, but you'll never see them. The cool thing about this image, there really is not the star, despite your best attempts to make me get excited about this star. The cool stuff in this image is that even though they weren't trying, there are dozens and dozens of galaxies here. So this, I think, was about half an hour exposure, so it's quite a short exposure from what they're going to be doing with JWST. And yet, even at that point, they're seeing lots and lots of, of galaxies in, at a level of detail that I don't think we've rarely seen before, um, without even trying. And so there's lots of excitement about the fact that there are many, many galaxies here. NASA are being quite careful not to release the raw data here, because they know perfectly well if they release the raw data, there will be many astronomers out there who'd start trying to do astronomy with it. And they really want to get their telescope nicely calibrated before they, people start actually trying to do science with it. So you can find many JPEG copies of this image, but you won't find the, you know, the raw astronomical data anywhere. I'm getting more and more, you know, I'm allowing myself to be excited. You know, previously you are kind of holding yourself back because you've always got in the back of your mind that there might be this enormous disappointment waiting around the corner. I think the chances of that disappointment, they're not gone, but they're now receding. So yeah, I'm sort of getting more excited. Plus when you know, when you start seeing images like that, where when the telescope isn't even trying, it's finding all these beautiful little galaxies. Um, I think that it's, it's a sort of taster of what's to come. And what for our star? Is this the last time we'll ever talk about this star? <laughs> I suspect so. Yes, it'll fade back into obscurity now because there really isn't anything very exciting to say about this star other than the fact that it was the star that was used to prove that the JWST was aligned correctly. I'm going to make it my life mission <laughs> to find <laughs> something exciting to give that star more glory. At this point, if you think about what the pulls of gravity is doing, the sun is pulling you that way, the earth is pulling you that way, so both of them are tugging you in the same direction. So the net pull on a satellite here is stronger than just the pull of the sun. 